this is what the Boston Central Artery looks like in the modern day, filled with parks, walkways, less traffic, and good air quality. This has not always been the case. Back in 1982, the city of Boston, in response to the traffic congestion and environmental problems caused by an old elevated highway, proposed a new mega project, famously known as the Big Dig, to reroute main highway I-93 through the heart of the city into a 1.5 mile underground tunnel and also construct a new tunnel I-90 to connect the airport, a new bridge over the Charles River, and a series of parks and public spaces on the surface. It was a massive undertaking that took 26 years to complete, costing over $21 billion adjusted for inflation plus the interest to date. The project is considered a major engineering achievement as it involved complex tunneling and bridge construction under difficult geological and urban conditions while minimizing disruption to the existing traffic and infrastructure. In order to gain public support and get government funding for the project, the project management promised the people of Boston that the construction process would not interrupt with their daily lives. Three independent tunnels were to be constructed, Ramp D, I-90 westbound and I-90 eastbound, it to pass underneath seven active rail tracks that serves Boston South Station and the Financial District, and through what has been described as the most difficult soil conditions imaginable. This meant they had to develop innovative design and construction methods. This right here will be the focus of today's video. My name is Shido Chashe. I talk about geotechnical engineering related topics including but not limited to construction methods, disasters, past, present and future innovations in ground engineering. Please like and subscribe to the channel. With that, let's dive deep into the video and talk about the unique geotechnical engineering techniques used during the big dig. This is Geotechs with Clements. A good place to start is by looking at the geologic and ground conditions the engineers were dealing with at the tunneling site. If we take a bird's eye view of downtown Boston and overlay 1630 onto a 1999 image, it is clearly observable that the shoreline shifted with time due to land reclamation that occurred in the past two centuries to cater for the rapidly growing Boston population. This meant that the uppermost layer, between 6 to 8 meters, consisted of miscellaneous fuel. The fuel material was primarily granular and contained numerous large obstructions such as cobbles, boulders, and fragments of concrete, steel, wood, bricks, and granite blocks, as well as an abandoned, depressed trackway. Underlying the fuel material was extensive continuous deposit of organic material in the range of 3 to 5 meters thick, which consisted mainly of organic silt with fine sand and some peat. From a geotechnical engineering perspective, these are called problematic soils because of their high compressibility and settlement potential. The lowest and thickest soil layer at each tunnel alignment was marine clay mixed with silt and the groundwater level at the site alternated between 2 to 3 meters below ground level. In any tunneling project or any project that requires deep excavation, these treacherous subsurface conditions complicate the design and construction procedure. To top it off, the tunneling was to be executed with the railroad in full operation, severely limiting the construction method options. A seven mile long highway being built underneath the skyscrapers of Boston and beneath the subway and beneath the railroad tracks. This is the equivalent of brain surgery. With no room for error, the engineers had to think outside of the box. They looked east for inspiration. You see, in Japan, back in 1968, a large diameter subway line was constructed beneath the Fukukawa River. 
The Tokyo Metropolitan government chose a unique but effective technique to stabilize the soft soil and prevent water inflow during the tunnel excavation. This technique is called ground freezing. Yes, ground freezing. As the name suggests, this technique converts in situ poor water to ice by continuously refrigerating the soil. The ice temporarily bonds the soil particles, making the soil impermeable and increasing its strength. With the ground conditions and construction restraints in Boston, the engineers found this to be the perfect technique for this part of the project because it provided multiple geotechnical functions including groundwater cutoff, encapsulation of the field debris within a matrix of frozen ground, and improvement in the strength of the organics and marine clay along the tunnel. After some deliberations with the city authorities, this method was finally approved and a green light was given to start the construction. In principle, freezing the ground consists of lowering the soil's temperature below zero degrees Celsius. The water in the ground freezes and the ground becomes a stronger mass. To lower the temperature, freeze pipes are drilled into the ground and a cold gas or fluid flows through, creating a temperature gradient between the soil and the pipes. The heat then flows from the ground to the pipes until a thermal equilibrium is reached. So, how did they manage to achieve this in the Boston Big Dig since the freezing was more extensive? To begin with, the design for the frozen mass was divided into two parts. A groundwater frozen cutoff wall at the edges and the central frozen mass. The pipes located on the perimeter were closely spaced to create the groundwater cutoff wall. This was to guarantee early closure of the freeze wall so that water flow from the outside to the central area was no longer possible. You see, there are two main methods for freezing ground. The first method is by using liquid nitrogen as a cooling agent. This is a fast but expensive method. Therefore, this method is mostly reserved for time sensitive or small ground freezing projects. This method was used in 2011 to create an ice wall around the Fukushima nuclear power plant reactor buildings. This successfully prevented the nuclear waste contaminated groundwater from leaking into the ocean when the reactor buildings were damaged by the devastating earthquake and the tsunami that followed. But there is a cheaper and a more suitable method for large freezing projects with longer construction periods. Brine, a salt concentrated water solution that is a lower freezing point compared to that of pure water can be used as a coolant in place of liquid nitrogen. Unlike liquid nitrogen, brine is readily available, safer and easier to handle. This solution was used in the Boston tunneling project. Once the required degree of freezing was achieved in the ground, a head wall was installed and a jacking pit was excavated which was used as the staging ground for the construction of the steel reinforced concrete tunnel box, housing the tunnel jacking equipment and extraction points of the excavated tunnel materials. The freezing process was so successful that the exposed 11.6 meter high freestanding vertical face did not show any signs of deterioration or instability, even after several days of inactivity. To minimize the friction between the upper surface of the box tunnel and the soil mass above, which could have resulted in a shear drag and causing huge distortions on the ground surface as the tunnel was being jerked forward, the engineers came up with an ingenious method. Steel cables were placed between the two surfaces. The steel cables were pulled with a mounted winch in the opposite direction as the tunnel box was being jerked forward. This successfully minimized the friction and the sheer drag leading to a successful project. All in all, the tunnel was jerked in place without incident or disruption to the rail services, and the use of the ground freezing technique 
was estimated to have resulted in a multi-million dollar saving to the overall project costs. You've been watching Geotechs with Clemens. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you found this video interesting or if you are someone who enjoys engineering and science and you want to show me some support.